If you are a PreSonus Studio One user, I believe there are 10 things that are absolutely necessary for you to do before you hit record. Before you go to record a song, before you start working on a project, make sure you go through these 10 things on this checklist and I guarantee you, you're going to have a whole lot more fun and be a whole lot less frustrated by the end of it. If you're a beginner to Studio One, everything I'm saying is going to be on a very beginner friendly level. So let's get started. 10 things you need to do before you hit the record button in PreSonus Studio One. First thing, after you've opened up PreSonus Studio One, you should see this main hub window. And right in the middle of the screen, it's staring at you, is this setup button. The first thing I want you to do is check your audio interface settings. So right here under setup, you should see a little picture that's a representation of your audio interface. I'm using a universal audio Thunderbolt interface. If you go to configure audio device, go ahead and click that button. It'll bring you to your audio setup window. You can access this from your settings anytime you're doing a session. When you get to the audio device tab, it's going to ask you for your playback device and your recording device. Most of you out there are going to have the exact same piece of hardware for your playback and your recording device. Mine is the universal audio interface plugged in via Thunderbolt. You might have a PreSonus interface. It might say audio box might be a focus, right? Scarlet, no matter what the interface is, make sure you're not set on built in output or any of these other things. It should be your audio interface nine times out of 10. That's the case. Also, it's probably gonna be the exact same thing for your recording device. Make sure your interface is selected and not this built in microphone. Can't tell you how many times if your interface is not plugged in and it's not showing up here, you're going to open up a session one day. And it's going to be selecting built-in microphone by default. When it starts squealing at you, that's not good. So make sure your interface is selected. Then on device block size, you need to be listening to your audio to find out, are you hearing clicks? Are you hearing pops? If you're having issues with your audio, like when you hit space bar, if you hear pops and clicks, mess around with this number, you might need to increase the value of how many samples it's set to a safe option would be around 512 samples. You won't have what's called latency. Latency is represented down here, 49 milliseconds. Notice if I change this from 2048 down to 512, look what happens to our latency. Now our latency is now 16.8 milliseconds, 11.2. It seems like the better option is to go as low as you possibly can, but just know that the lower you set this number, you're going to have more issues with cracks and pops in your audio. And you'll know exactly what that sounds like as you experiment. You want to be able to set this as low as you possibly can without getting those sounds. Okay. 512 is kind of a safe spot, especially if you're getting something like 16 milliseconds of latency. Okay. The last thing is the sample rate. Most of you out there are probably going to be just fine setting at 48 kilohertz. Okay. The higher your sample rate, technically speaking, the more higher quality or fidelity you're going to have with the frequency responses. 96 kilohertz is something that's common with iTunes standards. But if you grew up listening to CDs, I believe CDs were set to 44.1 kilohertz. So obviously if it was good enough for CDs, it's probably just fine at 48 kilohertz. Most of you out there are probably not going to be able to audibly hear the difference between 48 kilohertz and 96, but also the higher you set your sample rate, the more, your computer is going to struggle to produce sound. So you might even need to switch this to 44.1. That's not going to be something you change in studio one. That's going to be something that you change in the software that's specific for your interface. UAD uses this thing called the console. And down here at the bottom, I can change from 48 kilohertz. I can change 44.1, 48, 88.2 or 96 and so on nine times out of 10. Like I said, I keep it at 48. And that's good enough for me. Now that's our initial audio interface settings that you need to make sure are correct before you start recording anything on studio one, make sure those settings are correct. We are going to come back and adjust our inputs and outputs, but that's going to come in a later time when we're creating our first tracks. Now, the second thing on our checklist, things you need to do before you start recording in PreSonus studio one is you need to make sure that your folder destination is at the correct spot. What I mean by that, when you create new song up here at the top left, when you want to create a new song, let's call the song happy birthday. 
below the title of the song, it's going to ask you, where do you want to save all of your folders and information at? This is extremely important, especially if you use external drives. If you have flash drives or SSDs that are plugged into your computer, if this is going to be moving around. Click these three dots here and make sure your destination is set up properly. So mine, I have this studio SSD plugged in. It's not the internal drive on my computer. And then within that, there is a folder for songs and then I have a folder set up for my wife, Lana Green. So anytime we're doing any of her songs, I'll create a folder here. I'll say new folder. I'll call it the title of the song that I just gave it. I'll double click there. And now you can see my directory for where I'm going to be recording all my music is at volumes, studio one, SSD songs, Lana Green, happy birthday. Again, it's going to ask you sample rate. You should have selected 48 kilohertz most of the time or whatever you want your sample rate to be. That is that. So number two, make sure your folder destination is set up properly. So you're not scrambling around looking for files. If your SSD or external drives are not plugged in when you open up Studio One, you need to exit out of Studio One completely, plug in your SSD, make sure the volume is being read by your computer. Then when you open up your song, it won't give you all these errors about where are the files at. All right, the third thing I wanna emphasize is naming your song. We put in happy birthday. If you're an artist and you're wanting to come up with your own song and maybe you don't have lyrics to your song yet, Maybe you're just putting down song ideas. I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you give a title to your songs. If you don't title your songs, if you put in something like untitled one, it's going to be a pain when you're cycling through 30, 40, 50 different songs that all have the same title. Even if you don't know what the concept is, come up with something, call it brown tree. Make up some sort of name that you can associate with the project that you're working on. This process, you can also go back and rename the song at any point. So if you originally called this Brown Tree and it ends up being a song called North Carolina, you can go back and change it to North Carolina. Okay. But naming it is going to be happy birthday. Naming it is going to be very important not only for the naming of your files, every time you record a track in your song, you don't want to see untitled. You want to see names for files so that when you go looking for it later, you'll actually know what you're looking for. With all that being said, you can hit the OK button. Studio One will now give us a fresh canvas to be recording, but we're not done yet. Before you record anything, third thing I want you to do is name your song. Fourth thing on our checklist is to set the tempo for your song. Again, in the situation where you don't know what your song is going to be, you can absolutely just leave it at the default. I believe the default is going to be 68 for most of you out here, but down here at the bottom of your screen, it says tempo. If you click the numbers that are here, you can type in whatever value you want. If your song is at 120 beats per minute, type in 120 and hit enter. The reason you want to do this at the beginning if you go up here to where it has our view modes and you select tempo, do you see how it says 120? So once you've opened up the tempo viewer right here, it's going to give you a readout of what the tempo of your song is. If I change this 120 back to 68, look what happens. Okay. You can have different variations of your tempo, but before you record any tracks, you need to know that your tempo is going to be locked in when you're using external like virtual instruments or external keyboards, anything that's being software produced with MIDI, it's very dependent on what the tempo of your song is. So make sure you can get your tempo set as soon as possible because you don't want it time stretching all of your files as you're recording. Commit to a time signature and a tempo and go for it. The time signature can be accessed right next to it as well. We have 4-4 selected. You can change this to 6-4, you can change it to 6-8, whatever you want it to be. Nine times out of 10, you're probably sticking with 4-4. Four, four. Also, the key of the song, you can click this button here. If you know that it's going to be in A major, select A over here. All this document process is going to help you when you're recording your song. You want to put as much detail as possible because every track that you record is going to have certain information baked into it. It's going to have the title of the song. 
It's going to have a tempo associated with it. The more information you can put in earlier, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Now with the tempo, a good way to set the tempo, you can also double click down here. This is actually a tap tempo. So if I'm clicking with my finger on the word tempo, you can see it's changing. If I start clicking faster, now I've got 200, 234. If I slow my clicking down, it takes about four clicks or so, but it's gonna give you an average readout of your tempo, what the right tempo is. If you hit the C button on your keyboard, watch what happens to this metronome down here. Whenever this is blue, you're gonna be hearing a click track in your ears. Now, one of the most annoying things that happens with the click track is it's way too loud. So the next thing I want you to do on your checklist, number five, is to adjust the click track. Click this wrench that's right next to the metronome, and you'll have this window here called metronome setup. You can call it click if you want to. What it has is presets based on tools one and logic two. So the beat, like if we're in four, four, we're gonna hear the beat happen on every beat. Every quarter note is gonna sound like this, but then the accent is happening on the downbeat. So beat one of whatever measure on is gonna have the tools sound. All the other beats are gonna have logic, logical two. Let's hit the space bar and you can listen to the metronome yourself. Hit the space bar to stop it again. Now let's say you don't like the sound of that metronome. You can click tools one and you can change this. So the downbeat maybe is a cowbell and then the beat, what you're hearing more often, you can change it to rim shot. Let's take a listen to that. Now, choose whatever you'd like. You can also go in and make these exactly the same. If I set these both to the word beep, it'll sound like this. Now that metronome is terrible in my ears right now. I've got headphones on. I don't know if I'd be able to play to that. There's something very shrill about the beep sound, but mess around with these and find something you like. A tambourine might sound pretty nice. You can also mess with the volume of these things. So if you've got these both set to tambourine, well, you want the downbeat to be louder than the other beats. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the volume of this accent so that it's louder. And then the beat, I'm going to bring it down in value. Let's take a listen to that. Okay. You can also go in and store this preset so you don't have to do it every time you go to create a song in Studio One. But mess around with these sounds. You can also add a sound if you want to. Make it anything you want. Just know that some of these shriller sounds like the beep, you don't want these things to be picked up by the microphone when you go to record. So I tend to favor metronome sounds that are a little bit duller so that they're not breaking my eardrum and also so that the microphone's not picking up those sounds. Also with the metronome, if you click the mix tab at the bottom of the screen, just above your main fader, there is this right here that says click volume. If you click and drag down, you can adjust the entire volume of your click track. So I will come in here typically and I'll bring it all the way down to something like negative 14. That's a whole lot nicer on my ears. The thing is this click volume, when it's set to zero, when we're recording tracks, our tracks aren't hitting zero. So your acoustic guitar, your vocal is going to sound so quiet compared to this click track. It's just like when you load a virtual instrument, sometimes virtual instruments will blow your eardrums out because they're all trying to hit zero on your metering. You need to turn them down to like negative 12, negative 14. That'll be more comparable to what you're actually recording raw tracks with. So make sure you got that set where you like to. That was number five, adjust your click or adjust your metronome. Number six, this one is also very important. It's called arrange your song. So up here on this tab, like now I have the tempo view showing. If I don't want to show the tempo anymore, I can hide it. There's one called arranger. With the arrangement view, click the uh, inspector over here on the side. And with the arranger view, you can go to, let's say like the fourth measure of this song. If you double click up here in the arranger view, it's going to create a tab. These are just like tabs you would have like in a binder 
trying to keep information as far as what the arrangement of the song is. So say our intro has four measures. You can take this blue bar, click and drag, and you can change the length of your intro. If we know the intro is going to be two measures, we can leave as two measures. Just to the right of intro, if we double click again, it's going to give us one that's called verse. Let's say the verse is going to be this many measures. I double click again. It's giving me one called chorus. Chorus will be this many measures. As you can see, you can really get crazy with this. It'll try to guess what you're inputting right here. But the point is that you create this arrangement viewer so that you know what's going on in the song, if you can. If you're just doing songwriting and you're trying to come up with fresh ideas, you may not be able to do arrangement view just yet. You may not know what you're recording, but if you do know what you're recording, definitely take the time to put the arrangement view together. Over here on the inspector, if I double click this word bridge, I can change this to turnaround. And then instead of outro, I want it to say verse two. Instead of verse, I want it to say chorus two. You can also go in, if you right click next to the blue square, you can change the colors of these. So as you can see, this kind of view, though it may look a little insane to some of you out there, this is gonna help me set up a whole lot better when it comes to not only the arrangement of the song, but trying to keep a clear vision of what I actually wanna do. If you know the arrangement of your song, this is something that your group or the group you're recording has done many times before. This is going to be very handy because as you're adding instruments and tracks, you don't want to be skimming through trying to find where's that chorus at. I can just click right here and I know that this is the beginning of this chorus. Another cool thing about the arrangement view is watch what happens if I grab this chorus, if I click and drag it past the turnaround, let's see what happens. It will actually take everything that's below, everything that's making up that verse. And if you want to move it, say, let's do a verse after chorus one. Let's do verse one, then verse two. It'll actually take all of the audio tracks that are associated with that, and it'll move them with you. So you don't have to do the copy and paste function. Okay. Again, that's the arrangement view. If you can, step six, arrange your song. Use this arrangement viewer have it set up as much as possible. It's gonna save you a lot of headaches and times in the future. Number seven, this is probably the one you've been waiting on, is called add your tracks. Up here, there's a plus button. You can also hit the T on your keyboard to add a new track. Most of the time, you're gonna be adding what's called an audio track. Anything that's analog, like a voice, anything that you're miking up in the room that you're in or your studio, that's an audio track. An instrument track does not mean like a guitar. An instrument track means this is music that's coming from your computer. So a MIDI instrument is considered an instrument. Okay, That's why with the audio tab, it has a waveform represented. And then the instrument tab has a keyboard represented. Instrument tabs, this tab for instrument, is specifically set aside for virtual instruments. So if you use Easy Drummer, if you use native instruments, libraries, if you use loops, any sounds that are coming from your computer and not you in the room or the artist, that's called an instrument track. An audio track is, I believe nine times out of 10, probably what you're gonna be using. They'll say, I wanna add a lead vocal. Well, the name of this needs to be lead vocal. I want one lead vocal. I want the color to be whatever you choose for your template, okay? Lead vocal is gonna be purple for this one. It is a mono track because I'm only using one microphone on the vocal. There's no effects chain that I'm using. And then input, it should be according to whatever your audio interface has on it. So I'm gonna use input one for now. And output is gonna be main. Let's click okay. Now we have a lead vocal track. I mentioned earlier that we're not quite done with the audio interface. If you go up to the songs tab and do song setup, the song setup window has an audio input and output setup. As you can see, my microphone is plugged into input two on my interface, and you can see a readout of the volume coming from it. This grid is essentially telling the computer where to send audio. So inputs one and two are the two microphone inputs for my audio interface. So you can see up here, my audio interface is calling this mic line or high impedance one, mic line two. So that's 
if I want to do stereo, I would be plugging into left and right inputs one and two. My mono tracks, as you can see here, the name of the track input one is associated with microphone input one. Input two is associated with mic line two. So you need to draw a horizontal line from whatever this name is, and then make sure it connects vertically with whatever is on your interface. So my interface also has ADAT inputs. I can expand my interface to have more inputs. Well, I want ADAT1 to not be associated with input one. I want my ADAT to be associated with my ADAT instrument. So it should have here, let's call this Sapphire 1 and the next one Sapphire 2. I have a Sapphire Pro 40 at my church that I use for when I'm recording drums. So this should be typically what my input section of my other interface looks like. I have two inputs for my Apollo, which are here in the room with me. They're going to channels one and two. And then my Sapphire Pro 40 has eight channels. That's at the church. And it's set up for my ADAT1 through ADAT8. Okay. Your interface, most commonly, they have two inputs. You may only need to use these here. And these are mono tracks. Output section. Nine times out of ten, you'll never have to mess with this because the outputs of your interface are most likely they default to monitor left and monitor right. So those are like the speakers. And this is also being used for my headphones. So if everything looks good there, now when you hit apply, hit OK. Now on our lead vocal track, as you can see, when I hit this drop down menu, I have listed input one. So lead vocal is going to be plugged into channel one. Let's say I go to record and now my lead vocal microphone is plugged into channel two. To change it to channel two, just hit the drop down menu, input two. If I'm at the church and I'm doing a kick drum, let's add a kick drum track. If I hit the plus button or T on the keyboard, I can say kick drum. I want one kick drum. This one's going to be a red color. It's a mono track. I want to go to input Sapphire one. Now, as you can see, my lead vocal is going to channel two of my interface. My kick drum is being recorded from Sapphire one. Now let's go through and add all of our tracks. Again, hopefully the more information you know about what you're recording ahead of time, the more information you're going to be able to put in. But if I hit the T button on the keyboard, I'm going to go ahead and put in what's called a background vocal. I'm going to say background vocal. I want six of them. I'm going to pack them into this folder. I want to give it kind of a pinkish color mono track. And I'm going to start on input one. All of my background vocals are going to be using the same microphone. And when I hit OK, watch what happens. Now I have this folder where I can open the folder and see all of these six background vocals spread out for me. They're all using channel one. And I can also close the folder and it just makes it a lot easier a lot easier for you to be watching on the screen. Let's add some more tracks to this. So let's say acoustic guitar. I don't want to pack a folder. I just want one. Well, let's do two tracks of acoustic guitar. So two acoustic guitar tracks, yellow, mono, and input one as well. Now they've defaulted to put them in this folder. I want to highlight them, click and drag, move them out. So now I have two acoustic guitars. Now to pack these in their own folder, you can select them with shift, right click, and then go to pack folder. Now, instead of it being called track 11, I'm going to say acoustics. So these are my acoustic guitar tracks. These are my background vocal tracks. I've got a kick drum. Let's add a snare, one snare drum. It'll also be red. This is going to be on my Sapphire Pro 40 channel two. Let's do a duplicate. Tom one and Tom two. Tom one's going to be Sapphire channel three, Sapphire channel four. Okay. I won't keep going on with this. You can use this tool right here to click and drag to change the size of these tracks, but make sure you have all your tracks labeled, pack them into folders if you can, just to save visual space on your screen and then also make use of this right here to expand the tracks whenever you need to. So step seven on your checklist is to add the tracks. 
however many tracks you plan on having in your song, if there's going to be 200 tracks, try to go ahead and add all the tracks together. So then when it comes time to record, let's say I want to start with my acoustic guitar track. I can open up this folder. I can go to acoustic guitar one and I can arm it for recording. Then I can start recording right away. As soon as I'm done with that, if I want to record acoustic guitar two, I just clicked arm for recording on acoustic guitar two, and that can be off to the races. The next step is for you to set up your buses. Now your buses are going to be set up on this mix window. You can click and drag here to expand the view just a little bit. Also right here. So as you can see, I've got a lead vocal, two acoustic guitars, a bunch of background vocals, and some drums. Everything is going to end up going through what's called the main bus right here. I'm going to select all of these tracks, holding shift and clicking from left to right. I right click and I'm going to say add bus for selected channels. This bus, I'm going to call my mix bus. So now, as you can see, the output of these tracks are all headed toward mix. I can also select the drums, highlight them, right click and say add bus for selected channels. And I can call this one drums. So now my drums bus, my kick drum, snare, and my two toms, they're all outputting to my drums bus. From my drums bus, they're going to my mix bus. You can do the same thing with your background vocals, add bus for selected channels, background vocals. And then you can also output from your buses to other buses. So background vocals is going to go to its bus called vocals. My drums bus is going to go to a bus for music. And again, you can get as complex as you want to with this. I pretty much will always have a mix bus. Everything's got to go through my mix bus. And then I'll have a vocals bus and a music bus. So these over here, this is my lead vocal. Right now it's going to the mix bus. I want to send it to my vocals bus. My two acoustic guitar tracks. They don't have a bus set up for them just yet. So I'm going to right click and say, add bus for selected channels. I'm going to call this one guitars. My guitars bus is going to output to my music bus. And then from your music bus to the mix bus, getting your buses set up specific to whatever you want your template to be in the future. We've not recorded any tracks, but everything I'm doing in this video, what I'm going to end up doing is saving this as a template. So once you have it set up how you like it, what's cool is you can go in, make a template. So once you have all your buses set up, your template's finished. Buses can also be processed separately. So my guitars that are all being processed individually, they will also get processed. I can add plugins and things to my guitars bus where they have processing there. And then my music bus can all be processed together. So if I process something in my music bus, I'm not only affecting the guitars, I'm also affecting the drums, which are going into the music bus. The music bus doesn't contain my vocals. It also doesn't contain my background vocals or my lead vocal. It is strictly for my music. And then my music is being outputted to the mix bus. And the mix bus is where we're going to put our limiter, all that kind of fun stuff in the future. Now, step number nine on the checklist is to load your plugins. And I know that this is probably one where it's all up to taste, but there are certain plugins that you know that you're going to add to your mix, no matter what the mix is. I can go to my mix bus, hit this plus button, and I can go to PreSonus, and I can load what's called their limiter plugin. It may not necessarily be this limiter plugin. You may use a fab filter one. You might use Oz you might use Ozone by Isotope, but I know that I'm going to have a limiter set and you don't have to engage it. So next to all of your plugins, they have this power button. Whenever it's blue, it means that it's active. Whenever it's dulled out like that and it's gray, it means that it's not active. Go ahead and if you can, add whatever plugins you know that you're going to end up adding to your mix. I know, I know that I'm going to have some sort of EQ on my mix bus. I know that I'm going to have some sort of compressor on my mix bus. So if I'm creating my template and I know that this is going to be for every song I ever record, go ahead and add your plugins on your individual tracks. Let's say you want to add a compressor to your acoustic guitar tracks. Well, go ahead and add your compressors and disengage them. Whenever they're disengaged, they're not putting any strain on your computer at all. 
but they're at least available. So when you go to record or somebody comes in to record, they're not sitting there waiting for you to add a bunch of plugins. You've already got them ready to go. You can already set them to the settings that you want to have kind of what you're guessing is going to be the setup, and then you can disengage them so that they're ready whenever you need them. Number nine on your checklist, go ahead and make sure you have all the plugins loaded that you need to have. The last one is the easiest one of all, and that is to save, save, save. So command S if you're on a Mac will actually save your session. Studio one will actually save backups of your sessions by default, but it's okay to not trust it all the time. You go up here to file, save if you want to as many times as possible. Whenever you are going to record, hit command S. Whenever someone finishes recording, hit command S. If there is a second of free time where people are just standing around, go ahead and save. Save as many times as you can. And also know that anytime you need to save something separate, you can just use the save as function. So I can use the save as function to redirect my directory. Instead of it being in my SSD, let's say I want to record it straight to my documents folder. I can just click documents here and it will save my session. It will save my song to a separate folder in documents. Don't go too crazy with this though, because you, you can get in a real bind if you have multiple destinations for the same song. Because what will happen is if you save it to your documents folder and then later on you access the folder that's in your external drive, it won't have all of the settings and recordings that you had in your documents. Make sure you just have one setup when necessary. But my last tip to you before you record anything at all, make sure you have everything saved. And then what's cool also is you can save as template. So everything we've done, if you know that this is how you want to set up your songs before you do any recording, you can call this like this one was called happy birthday. Subtitle is Chris mixing at home. My description is UAD Apollo interface, lead vocal drums and guitars put whatever you want for the description. You can also change the picture that's here and then hit OK. And what that will do when you go to create a new song, you can go to your templates, click here, user. And what do we have? Happy birthday, Chris mixing at home. When I hit OK, I now have a new song with this exact template. And I can go in here, rename it, name it, happy birthday. 2023 remix. Okay. If you're just getting started off on studio one, I hope this video was super helpful to you. Hit the subscribe button for more content just like this. My name is Chris Green. I wish you luck in all of your recordings and I'll see you next time.